open our Bibles to the book of Daniel, chapter 2, and verse 40. Daniel 2.40 for our message from the Word of God this morning. You'll find Daniel 2.40 on page 901 if you're using the church Bible. Today is January 24th, 2021. Our text will be in Daniel 2.40, right on down to the end of the chapter in verse 49. And the title of this morning's message is The Unidentified Nation. The Unidentified Nation. And we begin with the story of two men who were talking at work one day. And one of them said to the other, Guess what? I had my first UFO experience that, uh, earlier this morning. And the other man said, Oh yeah? <laughs> How'd that happen? And he said, Well, I was walking in the kitchen this morning, and I said to my wife, Good morning, fatso. <laughs> and suddenly there were flying saucers coming at me from every direction. <laughs> And deservedly so, I might add. Well, when I was a kid, we used to talk about people who thought they saw flying saucers. That's what we called them in those days. These days, they're called UFOs, unidentified flying objects. And speaking of things that are unidentified, here in Daniel chapter 2, the prophet Daniel is interpreting a dream for King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And he tells him that his dream means that someday, an unidentified nation was going to conquer him. And that another unidentified nation would eventually conquer them. And now he's about to tell the king about still another unidentified nation. Tell you what, let's begin in verse 36 to get the context where we left off after our scripture reading this morning. In Daniel 2.36, Daniel said to the king, This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, 
One that we saw in our scripture reading was a kingdom of silver. And another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, this fourth kingdom will be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron. For as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And finally in verse 43, whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Now, last week we saw that later in the book of Daniel, Daniel identifies that first unidentified kingdom, the kingdom of silver. And he identified them as the nation of Media Persia. And history tells us that the Medes and the Persians were the ones that conquered Babylon. We also saw that later in the book of Daniel, he identifies that kingdom of brass as the nation of Greece. And Sure enough, history tells us that it was the Greeks who conquered the Medes and the Persians. But now, if you know the book of Daniel, you know that he never does identify this fourth kingdom of iron that will eventually conquer the Greeks. We know from history, if you're paying attention in history in school, <laughs> we know from history that the Romans conquered the Greeks. So, how come God didn't have Daniel identify them later in the book? Well, as we're going to see in our study of the book of Daniel, this fourth kingdom is the kingdom that produces the Antichrist. And God knew that he was going to interrupt Daniel's prophecy with what the Apostle Paul calls in Ephesians 3, the dispensation of the mystery. And that's why he didn't let Daniel name the fourth kingdom. Now, after the rapture brings a conclusion to this dispensation of the mystery, God is going to pick up right where he left off and another nation will arise that will be a lot like the Roman Empire. And it will produce the Antichrist. So the description that Daniel's giving us here of the nation that would conquer Greece is also a description of the nation that will eventually produce the Antichrist. And as we're about to see, there's a lot of similarities. For instance, <clears throat> 
Did you know that the Roman Empire is associated with iron? Give you a little homework. <clears throat> Go home and Google the words Roman Empire and iron. And the first thing that comes up will say that the Iron Age started long before the Roman Empire came along. But, it'll add that it was weapons of iron that enabled the Romans to conquer the world. Like Daniel said in verse 40. Let's back up to verse 40 and read it again. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, <clears throat> for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. Daniel is saying that the Romans were going to come along and break everything that got in their way. And they did. They did it because they were strong as iron. But listen, the nation that's going to produce the Antichrist is also going to be strong as iron. And they're also going to be associated with iron in some other ways. Let's read verse 43 again and you'll see what I mean. In verse 43 it says, And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Now notice it says that they will mingle themselves with the seed of men. You know what that means? That means whoever they are, they must not be the seed, the, the seed of men. Otherwise it wouldn't make any sense to say they will mingle themselves with the seed of men, right? And who they are, of course, are fallen angels. Fallen angels who will mingle their seed with the seed of men just like they did in your first reference in Genesis 6-2. Back in the days of Noah, it says, The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And nine months later, there were giants in the earth in those days. Now that phrase, sons of God, there, that refers to angels. Look what God told Job in your next reference in Job 38, 4-7. He said, When I laid the foundations of the earth, the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And listen, the only ones who were around to see God lay the foundations of the world were angels. And the only angels who would mate with women were fallen angels. And we've talked about that before. The reason they did that <clears throat> was to try to pollute the line of the Lord Jesus Christ <clears throat> and make sure, hang on, <clears throat> and make sure that our Savior could never be born. And in your next reference, you see that God judged them for doing that. <clears throat> in Jude 1, verses 6 and 7, the angels which kept not their first estate, their real estate in heaven, but left their own habitation, came down to earth, he reserved in everlasting chains under darkness to the judgment of the great day. Well, what did they do that was so bad? Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, giving themselves over to fornication and going after 
strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. In other words, those angels did what they did in Sodom. They fornicated with flesh that was strange to them and fathered a race of giants. Giants that God had to kill off with Noah's flood. But then, Satan heard God say in your next reference in Genesis 9.15, The waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. <laughs> so he said, oh, okay. If he's not going to kill all my giants by flooding the world again, I'll just have my fallen angels do it again. So in Genesis 6.4, your next reference, it says there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, after the flood, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old. So, we see that it's happened in the past, and folks... It's going to happen again. And the thing about these fallen angels is that they're associated with iron. Look at your next reference. The Apostle John tells us about something that's going to happen in the tribulation in Revelation 9, 1-10. I saw opened the bottomless pit, and there came out locusts and not your average everyday locusts because these were locusts as scorpions and their faces <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> were as the faces of men and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of what of iron and they hurt men now, I know it says they were locusts, <laughs> but when it says that they had faces like men, that tells you they were demonic fallen angels. Because in the Bible, all angels are men. Now, I didn't say all men are angels, right, right ladies? Uh, that's not the case. <laughs> but... I, and in here any amen, so I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> but every angel in the Bible is either called a man or is referred to with masculine pronouns. And fallen angels are associated with iron. And do you know who else in the Bible is associated with iron? Those giants that they fathered. As you see in your next reference in Deuteronomy 3.11 where Og, king of Bashan I love that name. I always say, you know, when he was born they looked and said, oh he's so cute. Let's name him Og. <laughs> Og, king of Bashan of the remnant of the giants behold his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Nine cubits was the length of it. Four cubits, the breadth of it. Do you believe that story? I think it's a lot of bunk. A bunk. <laughs> I didn't hear any amens. <laughs> now listen, it also says that it was a bunk of iron. And that tells you that he was a chip off the old block. His pappy was a pistol. He was the son of a gun. An iron gun! Right? By the way, that gives you some idea of the size of these giants. Because a cubit, they say, is about a foot and a half. So, Og's bunk here is 13 and a half feet long. But we know that he wasn't some beanpole basketball player for the NBA, six foot skinny, because it was also six foot wide. 
That old boy was a big, beefy dude, big enough to eat Hulk Hogan for breakfast and snack on Andre the Giant for lunch, or whoever the current big wrestlers are. But now, when those giants had children, they didn't end up being quite as big as you see in your next reference, where we read about another one of those giants who lived about 400 years later. 1 Samuel 17, 4-7, Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. The staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, big old piece of lumber, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. Iron. By the way, that's about 15 pounds. Imagine being able to chuck. <laughs> you know, a spear has to be balanced. And if you got a 15 pound piece of iron, imagine how long that, that lumber would have had to be. But you'll notice that he was only six cubits in a span. That means he was only about ten feet tall. But he was still associated with iron. Just like these giants in Antichrist's kingdom are going to be. Now, if you need more proof that fallen angels are going to father kids in the tribulation... Look what the Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew 24, 37. <clears throat> but as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, as in the days that were before the flood, they were marrying and giving in marriage. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And folks, the kind of marrying they're going to be doing is the kind that made God flood the world in the days of Noah. I mean, why, would else, why else would you mention marrying and giving in marriage? Okay, now that we know that what the iron of Antichrist's kingdom represents, What's the clay all about? <laughs> well, look what Job said about God in Job 4, 18 and 19. He said, God puts no trust in his servants and his angels, he charged with folly, how much less in them that dwell in what? Houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust. Well, you know who he's talking about when he talks about people whose foundation is in the dust. Genesis 2.7 says, The Lord God for man of the dust of the ground. Isaiah also calls us clay when he prayed in your next reference. Isaiah 64.8, O Lord, Thou art our Father, we are the clay. Thou art our potter, and we are all are the work of thy hand. So, Antichrist's kingdom is going to be made up of the clay of people and the iron of fallen angels. Just like Og and Goliath and all the other giants back then. Now, maybe you're thinking, oh, wait a minute, Pastor. Verse 43 says, They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Well, folks, just because those fallen angels won't cleave doesn't mean they won't mingle. <laughs> It just means they won't cleave after they mingle. Mingle means they mix their seed. Look at your next reference in Ezra 9, 1 and 2. The people of Israel have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, for they have taken of their daughters for themselves, the Gentiles, and for their sons, so that the holy seed have what? mingled themselves with the people of those lands. 
Well, these future fallen angels will mingle their seed with the seed of men, just like that. They just won't cleave to the seed of men. So well, what does that mean? Well, look at your next reference in Genesis 2 and verse 24. You know this verse. After God created Adam and Eve, he's, uh, Adam said, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and do what? Cleave to his wife. Now that word cleave there means more than just have sex with your wife. It means to be joined unto your wife and to stay joined unto your wife and not leave her. That's how cleave is used in your next reference when Moses told the Jews in Deuteronomy 11.22, Love the Lord your God to walk in all His ways and to cleave unto Him. If you think Moses was telling them that they should cleave to the Lord to get saved and after that have nothing to do with Him, well, you're thinking like a lot of Jews did think back then and how a lot of Christians think today, right? But you're not thinking like God thinks. And if you think marriage is just about sex, well, you're thinking like a lot of men do today. Men who love a woman and father a child with her and then leave her with the child that they fathered. But you're not thinking like God if you're thinking like that. When God says to cleave to your wife, He means to be joined unto her and stay joined unto her. But that's not what these fallen angels are going to do. They'll be more of the love them and leave them types. You know, the deadbeat dad types. And all of this explains what we read in verse 41. Let's read verse 41 again. We're kind of working our way through the verses again because they're verses that are important to understand. Verse 41, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay, part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided but there shall be in it of the strength of iron. For as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Notice it says the iron was mixed with the miry clay. That means the fallen angels will mix with women. They just won't cleave to the women. And when that verse in verse 41 says that Antichrist Christ's kingdom will be divided. Well, you hear a lot about our country being divided these days between Democrats and Republicans, but you know what? We're still one country. And in a Christ kingdom will be one country. It'll just be divided between the seed of men and the seed of fallen angels. It, it's kind of like how God told King Belshazzar in your next reference in Daniel 5.28, Thy kingdom is what? Divided. Divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Well, the Medes and the Persians were one nation divided into two kingdoms. And Antichrist's kingdom will be one nation divided into the kingdom of the seed of men and the kingdom of of the seed of the fallen angels. And that explains verse 42. So let's read verse 42 again. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron, part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Now, that word broken there doesn't mean broken to pieces like it did earlier in this passage. Believe it or not, that word broken there just means the opposite of strong. I looked up the word broken in my old dictionary that I trust so much. It's so good at defining King James words. And one of the definitions of broken is weakened. 
It gave the example of like when we say someone has broken health. Well, I don't know that we say that so much anymore, but I know that here in verse 42, that's how the word uh, broken is being used. Because it's saying that Antichrist's kingdom will be strong and partly not strong. It'll be partly strong because it's the seed of the fallen angels and partly broken, partly weakened because it's the seed of weaker men. Now, notice that verse 42 kind of focuses in on the toes of this kingdom. And we know what those ten toes represent. They represent kings. Kings who will join themselves to the Antichrist. And we know that because later God gives Daniel a vision of this fourth kingdom. In Daniel 7, verses 7 and 24. Daniel says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had what kind of great teeth? Iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamp the residue with the feet of it. And looky here, it had ten horns. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. That's the ten toes here. Now that doesn't convince you that the ten toes represent ten kings. In your next reference, God gave the Apostle John a vision of those same ten kings in Revelation 17, 3 to 12. John said... I saw, and he's having a vision, I saw a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having ten horns. And the angel said to me, the, the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet but receive power as kings one hour with the Antichrist, the beast. Now every time I read that verse, I remember, see when you've been saved for 50 years, <laughs> you remember all this stuff. I remember years ago in the 50s and 60s when the nations of Europe formed something they called the European Common Market. Anybody remember that phrase? All the prophecy preachers went berserk. <laughs> Oh, the rapture must be very near. There's the ten kings gathering together that'll be with the Antichrist. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says that they will receive power one hour with the beast. The Bible says those kings won't rise until the beast arises. But when he does, he's going to have a ten-nation confederacy. And you see a type of them in your next reference in Psalm 83, 1-8. This is kind of a tribulation prayer. But it was a prayer that, Dan, that uh, I think it was David, prayed at that time. Psalm 83, 1-8, O God, thine enemies make a tumult. And they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. The tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites of Moab, the Hagarenes, the Gebelites, and the Ammonites. You go down through that list there, folks, and if you count those nations, guess how many there are? There's ten of them. And they're all busy doing what Antichrist kings are going to be doing, trying to wipe out Israel. 
the faithful Jews who will be hiding from Him, like in the third line of that big paragraph there, thy hidden ones are hiding from the Antichrist. By the way, the next time you hear a southerner say the south will rise again, just remind them that in the Bible, a confederacy is not a good thing, right? Yeah. When, Psalm 80, when this Psalm 83 confederacy rises again, faithful Jews are going to have to do... What Isaiah 8 says, and remember these words, Isaiah 8, 12, and 13, Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy, neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts Himself, and let Him be the thing you're afraid of, and let Him be your dread. That's saying when those ten kings start their saber rattling to try to scare you to join the Antichrist like they did, you fear God instead of fearing them. That's the context of Isaiah 8. Look at Isaiah 8 and verse 9. Associate yourselves with this confederacy, O ye people, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Give ear, all ye of far countries, gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, and what? Ye shall be broken in pieces. Folks, that's what the Lord's going to do when He comes to those nations. Break them in pieces. Daniel says it again. Now let's read on in your text in verse 44 in your Bible. He says, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it will stand forever. Now when it talks about the days of these kings, those are the ten kings who will be broken to pieces by the kingdom that God's going to set up. We call it the kingdom of heaven because, well, what would you call a kingdom set up by the God of heaven? <laughs> the kingdom of heaven, right? And listen, when the Lord Jesus Christ showed up in the book of Matthew, He preached the same thing John the Baptist preached. He said, repent for what? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's time to have this kingdom that Daniel's talking about here, he says. But we know that it was put on hold by the dispensation of the mystery. But it's coming, folks. And when it comes, Daniel 2.44 says, it will never be destroyed. And he says it won't be left to other people. You say, what does he mean by that? Well, folks, the kingdom of Babylon was left to the Medes and the Persians. And the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians was left to the Greeks. And the kingdom of the Greeks was left to the Romans. That's not going to happen anymore, he says. It won't, God's kingdom won't be left to other people. His kingdom, it says in Zechariah 14, the Lord will be king over all the earth. And after that, in Isaiah 2, 4, they'll beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks, Nation will not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore, so there's not going to be any more this nation conquered that nation and conquered that nation. Now, when it says that it'll stand forever, that used to puzzle me because I, know, I knew that later in the New Testament it talks about the Millennial Kingdom. And, and so whenever you read this verse, you have to remember that after the first thousand years, something happens, <laughs> something big that you read about in Revelation 20, verses 7 to 21. One, when the thousand years are expired, Satan will go out to deceive the nations, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. 
and fire will come down from God out of heaven and devour them. And then, John says, I saw a new earth. So the kingdom that Daniel's talking about here that God's going to establish will stand forever. But after that first thousand years, it's going to stand on a brand new planet. It's going to stand on the new earth. Now, whew, that's an awful lot to take in. We, we just covered the course of human history. And so in case the king had any trouble following all that, Daniel kind of sums it up in verse 45. He says, For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out out of the mountain without hands by the virgin birth of Christ, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. Well, we saw last week the stone is Christ. And when He returns seven years after the rapture, after the tribulation, He's going to smash the feet of that image because the feet of that image represents the culmination of all the wickedness of all those kingdoms that come before. All the, the culmination of the times of the Gentiles like we talked about last week. And it's going to end with a bang. <laughs> I, I believe in the Big Bang Theory. I just believe it hadn't happened yet. But listen, it's, this is, and, and it, it's going to come. And so what that tells you is if you think the world is going to end in a nuclear holocaust when I was, you know, like we did when I was a kid, my, I'm, I'm kind of a little bit too young to remember the Bay of Pigs thing, but my cousin, a year or two older, he says, yeah, he says, I went to bed that night with my bow and arrow. He thought maybe they were, you know, the Russians were going to invade or something. <laughs> I don't know. If you think the world is going to end with a nuclear holocaust or uh, by a flood caused by global warming or, or by an asteroid hitting the earth like we hear talked about or, or, or a super virulent COVID-19 virus, you can put all those worries to bed because Daniel just told you how the world's going to end. And he says that the dream is certain and the interpretation is sure and I believe him. How about you? Amen. And if you think Nebuchadnezzar was grateful that <laughs> he was able to interpret his dream, you're right. Look at verse 46. Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. And the king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings, which is really something because he's a king, <clears throat> and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. And then in verse 49, Daniel requested of the king. He said, don't forget my buddies. Don't leave them out. He requested of the king and the king set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel sat in the gate of the king. And our final point is that that, that phrase, the gate, that means Daniel was given a place in the government of Babylon. Uh, the gate was where the rulers of a city would meet to conduct their business. Look at your last reference. Speaking of the virtuous woman, it says her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth with who? The elders of the land. So Nebuchadnezzar, he must have been mighty grateful to Daniel for interpreting his dream and 
telling him what the future was going to be like. And you know what? If he didn't become a believer in Daniel's God here, I think he does in, in the next chapter, in chapter 4, that we'll consider next week. And you know what that means, don't you? Someday, you get to meet him. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we live in a world where people are always wondering how this world's going to end. All those theories we mentioned a moment ago, people worry about those things. People wonder about They go to see psychics and fortune tellers and read their horoscope to find. Find what you've laid out to, for us so clearly today. It's our privilege to serve the God that Daniel served and be able to put our confidence in the one that not only created heaven and earth but is not going to let it go on forever and in sin and degradation. We're thankful you have a plan for it. And we're thankful for saving us by your grace and letting us be part of your plan for today, this dispensation. We pray it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.